Today is March the 22nd, 2017. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with the Oklahoma State University Library. And today I am in Life Sciences West to speak with Dr. Kristen Ball. And this is the beginning of our project on monarchs. So thank you for having us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's start with learning a little bit about you. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Waynesboro, Virginia, which is in the Blue Ridge Mountains, so a little bit more topography than here in Oklahoma, um, and September 29th, which I will mention because it ties to the monarch story as well, because that's also when we typically see peak migration here in this part of Oklahoma, so it's always a good birthday gift to see monarchs <laughs> coming, so. <laughs> so. And you want to say the year? Oh, 1972. 72. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where did you go to elementary school, high school? You know, take us through your early, early school years. Okay, so all in Waynesboro, Virginia. So, um, and I guess we had several elementary schools, but uh, once you got to the higher grades, you know, just a single high school, so um, somewhat of a small town type of environment. Um, and then when I graduated from high school, I went to the College of William Mary, which is a state school in Virginia, in Williamsburg, Virginia, um, and then I graduated from college in 1994, um, and then I had a couple of field jobs. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I had not done research as an undergrad, as I always encourage my, my students here to do, and so I had a couple different field jobs. Um, uh, I had an internship in Florida, and uh, I trapped small mammals in, in Virginia, um, and then one of the more formative experiences was I worked on a, a big corridor project looking at corridor use um, in South Carolina, and so that included butterflies, and mm -hmm. so I've kind of continued to, to work on those same questions uh, once I went to graduate school. So I did my master's um, at Texas A&M in the Wildlife and Fisheries Department, and I looked at hummingbird foraging behavior, so that was, that was fun. I'd like to do that again someday. Um, and then I got my PhD in the entomology department at Texas A&M, and I worked on uh, the ecology of um, feral honeybees, so in that case, South Texas, so primarily Africanized honeybees. And then I had a uh, two-year postdoc at Louisiana State University, um, and then I joined the faculty here at OSU in 2005. You got smaller and smaller from mammals to, uh, to honey, honeybees. Yeah, yeah. Well, back in the elementary school days and junior high in that area, what was your your favorite subject? Science was always one of my, my top uh, uh, top subjects, and um, and we used to always go camping. Actually, didn't think I stayed in in a hotel until much later in life. But uh, but yes, that was always our family vacations was camping somewhere. So I think we had a tent you know, in the early days and then one of those pop-up campers, which I just saw one of the other day. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of time outdoors. So speaking of family, talk a little bit about that. How many brothers, sisters, parents? I have one sister and we're actually twins, um, but we are fraternal. So we, some people think we look alike and some people think we don't even look like we're related. But she is an electrical engineer. So she, so sciences, but quite, quite different. So, <laughs> uh, so still, still in that STEM, STEM area, and she lives in Washington D.C. Okay. And what did your parents do for a living? Um, so my mom worked at a bank, and so she was, um, I guess, the teller for a while, and then a loan officer. And of course, she took a few years off when she had my, my sister and I. And my um, dad was a mechanical engineer, and so he worked at a, um, so I guess he would design parts for different pieces of equipment and and I still rely on him at times when I need to build something for the lab you know some piece of of um, equipment to use in field work so I've called on his expertise on occasion uh, and it's kind of very handy he's even you know, sent me prototypes of, of he has a woodworking shop in the basement so uh, so definitely definitely a good resource so so higher education was always on the on the books, it wasn't wasn't something that just. Well, my sister happened. and I were the first to go to college oh, in our okay. family, so um, so I guess my dad had a technical degree, and then my mom, of course, graduated from high school. But uh, but yes, I mean, first to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you went all the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although the joke in the family, my sister, I think. I mean, she graduated um, from Virginia Tech with her electrical engineering degree and got a you know good job um, straight out. And then she went in the evenings to earn her 
master's, um, but the joke was she didn't want to earn her PhD because she didn't want to take the cut and pay. So, because <laughs> so, engineering is a little bit more of a lucrative field than, than perhaps biology, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so and that was the, the joke in the family. So. <laughs> well, Virginia Tech, if I remember, is a very pretty campus with stone buildings and stuff. It's very nice, and I think OSU is somewhat modeled off, off of the Lemon and Mary design, oh. so, which is interesting. So. That is. I've been there, too. It is pretty, and I can see the, the relationship there. Yeah. So you grew up in the Appalachian, northern Appalachians, I guess, if you're from Blue Ridge Park. Blue Ridge, yeah. yeah. So that's the migratory pattern, I guess, or migratory flight pattern for the eastern monarchs? Well, so we, we call the whole kind of eastern half of, so kind of from Texas north um, to the east coast is kind of the eastern migratory population. Okay. And we actually have a lot more monarch activity than they do on the east coast, so it kind of uh, uh, gets a lot more sparse. Um, but uh, my parents do have milkweed on there. They have a, some cattle and uh, some land uh, in their retirement. And so they do have some common milkweed, which I was, and I'm not there often in the summer, so I was excited when, um, you know, and I, you know, occasionally go out for a jog, and it's amazing just within, you know, a couple miles of their house how much milkweed you can find out there. So, <laughs> so uh, but, but much taller than the milkweed we have here, so. I grew up in western North Carolina, so in the Haywood County area, I don't know if you're familiar with that too, but we had monarchs. On, the, on occasion, you might know, remember them coming through. Well, they're, they're neat to see. And that is the nice thing about Oklahoma, you know, is they kind of all get funneled, and of course Texas even more so, but uh, so we get to see most of them coming through versus just, you know, the few that would be, be just in our area. Well, so. What's your earliest memory of, of, of one? Do you um, that's a good question. You know, some people have you know, great stories of, like, they remember, you know, aggregations in the fall, and, um, but I don't really have any, you know, great, um, you know, in terms of, um, and actually, if you, um, when you talked about Hamilton, we'll have to ask him about, uh, you know, some of his, his stories, and then Dennis Martin has some good stories, too, but I don't have any great monarch stories, so, um, and I don't know if you want me to tell you how I got interested sure, in sure. monarchs, um, oh, okay. uh, so, um, one of the first projects I did when I got to OSU was looking at native bees, um, and I have, I don't know how much I should share, but I have a now 15-year-old, but at the time, you know, she was quite young, and so I needed to have field sites in close proximity, to campus so I could, you know, pick her up from daycare, you know, all within a lot of time frames. And so, you know, it's always interesting thinking about what influences why you ended up doing what you did where. So I'm not sure what I would have picked without uh, life constraints, but uh, but we have um, the Stillwater Research Range, uh, which is um, if you go out west on 51 and then south on, on Coil Road, and it's, um, uh, you know, a, a rangeland site where they do patch burning, so they have part of the um, pasture they'll burn in the spring, part in the summer, and then by the end of three years you burn the whole thing. And so it's really cool because you go out there and you can see the differences in the plant community among all of the, the different plots. And so that was, I mean, I guess actually I went out there for a project related to ticks. It was my first um, for a collaborator over at the, at the vet school, Mason Reichert. And then when I was out there, you know, looking at all the, the different, you know, the diversity of the plants, and I'm like, this would be perfect for pollinator work. And so I worked on native bees um, out there. So looking at responses to to the, the burning regimes, primarily in the context of the, the plant community. So bee diversity and, and abundance. And so then when they burn in the summer, um, you know, you're out, I'm out there doing bee surveys, and, um, and they usually burn mid-July, um, and then the first thing that comes back, you know, the grasses start to come back, but the milkweed comes back. Um, it's, you know, kind of the main vertical structure out there, and it blooms, and, um, and so then, of course, milkweed, the first question that comes to mind is monarchs, and so, <laughs> and so then, then we got interested in, in, in monarchs, and I had a couple undergraduates that worked with me, and so the first year, you know, we looked up to figure out when peak migration would be, and so we kind of focused on that time period, which is a little late, um, because, because there wasn't much in the literature about those fall breeding monarchs that we have that, that come right around the time classes start, so mid-August, mid um, and so we kind of 
anyway, it was a little bit of a learning experience, kind of figuring out that timing. And now a large part of my research is focused on those, those fall breeding or late breeding monarchs. And so again, um, we start seeing our first eggs usually around August 15th and then um, a lot of caterpillar activity. So again, well before peak migration at the end of, end of September. So. so you're busy for a couple of months span there. Yes, yes. And of course, there's lots of other things. Um, and I was going to say, I've been, um, I had my first milkweed observation uh, for this year on Saturday. Uh, so and they have, um, there's a citizen scientist project uh, where you can contribute your first sightings. It's called Journey North. And so you, know, you take a picture and you, you know, submit the first milkweed of the year. But it's always amazing. And, and I have a roadside site that I go to that's near my house and you can see the stalks of the plants from the previous year because everybody's like well how did you find that tiny little um, sprout that was just uh, coming up and so you, know, you kind of have some some cues to know where, where to look um, but it's amazing how big it gets how quickly and so I've, I've been going and taking to have two plants I'm taking pictures of every day just to, to entertain myself <laughs> uh, but uh, but anyway so they've already you know after four days one's already got flower buds and it's so it's amazing how quickly they just take off once once they emerge from the ground. And you do the fast photography. Yeah, fun. I'm a little off on exactly where I take the picture in. So um, so I, I need to do better next year. But it's a starting point because I've been thought, thought about it every year and haven't haven't done it. But um, Well, photography, was that a tool of the trade they, they taught you along the way or did you pick it up? Not, and of course now I just take my cell phone out, right? Um, but I do have, well, it was a nice camera maybe 15 years ago, right? <laughs> so I do have, have a nice camera, but now they have such nicer cameras that I probably need to, to upgrade. But that is one of, it is fun to take uh, you know, bees and butterflies, and um, so it's fun to kind of uh, enjoy doing that as well as a side project. But. So when you're traveling around Oklahoma, is that some of the things you're looking for? Milkweed or or certain things a scientist would not... Yeah, I spend a lot of time looking for, for milkweed, and you can do it driving down the road at you know, 65, 70, and if it's you know, turnpike, 75 miles an hour. <laughs> uh, it, when it, especially um, like May, you know, once the plants are up and the buds are formed and then the flowers are that light green, so really easy to spot. So, you know, Again, going 75 miles an hour down the highway, you can still spot it. Um, and so you know, everybody always talks about the I-35 corridor, and I have a conference in May I usually go to, and so driving down I-35, I'm always like, look at all them, and they constantly, look at the milkweed, oh, can you see that field? And, but anyway, so uh, I think it probably may not be as enjoyable for those with me. But <laughs> and then, you know, in Virginia, I was thinking when I was um, uh, home, uh, you know, again, for common milkweed, you know, it's so tall, and again, once you get that search image, you can spot it, and it's impressive how much is along the, the road sides in Virginia as well. So. It's almost, you need a GPS unit so you can map where these patches are. Yeah, and we've, I have a, a master's student who will be finishing this um, semester, and one of his projects, because uh, we've done, you know, a lot of Burpa monarchs and milkweeds, but we usually pick sites because they're good sites, you know, so they're ones that have a lot of milkweed. So then the question is, well, how much milkweed is there in the state? And so um, so we tried to have a more objective <laughs> way of looking at it. And so um, so we, we, we picked different roads that would be safe to get out on the shoulder on. Um, and then, you know, he stopped every 10 miles and got out and made an estimate of milkweed density. And then we, there's a method you can use um, where if you can measure the distance to what you can see, like so from the fence line on adjacent land, then you can kind of get an estimate of you know, how much is, is there, you know, not just on road sides, but, but broader scales. So, um, so yeah, we've been trying to trying to get at that question. It's, it's a challenging one given you know, how much space we have, but we do have a lot of good, good habitat and a good bit of milkweed in, in Oklahoma. So. It sounds like you need to have some math skills too if you're... Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, within Oklahoma, where's the largest uh, amount? I, mean, I would imagine the panhandle wouldn't have very much. And, and I guess the species you have shifts. And so we have one, Asclepias spiritus, and common names are a little bit of a problem because they kind of overlap and people call um, different species the same common names. Um, so I guess green milkweed would be given the scientific name, Beardus, would, would make a lot of sense, but then some people call it green antelope horn or 
Um, so it has, a, but there's other ones that are called antelope horn and others that are called green. And uh, so it gets a little confusing. But we have one that's that's the most common throughout most of the state. And then if you move a little farther west, um, it's Asclepias asperula. So it looks really similar, but it's uh, morphologically a little bit a little bit different. And so, um, but yeah, so it kind of shifts. But uh, but that I-35 corridor, um, which we think about as being a general, and it's an easy, you know, it's not literally the I-35 corridor, it's much broader than, than that, but um, but that is an area where, where there is a, a good bit of milkweed in, in Oklahoma, so kind of thinking about that central part of the state. So if you get farther east, especially, you know, southeast, you hit more um, of the wooded forested areas of Oklahoma, so there's at least less that you would find on the roadsides or in open fields there, and then, you know, farther west again, and it, it kind of shifts to, to different species. Well, we should probably back up and say why milkweed is important in, in regards to the monarch. Um, so milkweed would be the um, host plant for monarchs, mm-hmm. um, and so that's their food source for the, the caterpillars, and that's the only thing that they'll eat. And there are a few, um, so most of them are in that genus Asclepius. I mean, there are a few in, in other genera that they'll use, um, uh, but yeah, for the most part, that that's it. So uh, so that's the, the main resource and it's also a great um, nectar source for a lot of, of other insects and so at the rangeland sites I talked about um, when we did the bee surveys we would do um, uh, netting surveys and we record what plants you know what flowers we collect bees from and so in May and June um, the green milkweed Asclepius viridis and that's the one that most you know that you had the most bees on and so it's a great resource I think bumblebee queens in the spring as well it's a really important um, nectar source for them so good for lots of other things um, and lots of other butterflies and, um, and insects use that for, for nectar as well. Well and that's seasonal it just blooms or so, it bloom? um, this is the, one of the, the main parts of my, my research and so it, it blooms um, and so we if you were to pick like kind of the peak time if you wanted to kind of document the most milkweed out there um, it would be you know May would be what we would pick and so but and so then by um, early July um, you know, we'll have set seed and the seed pods usually at least around here open you know the first week or two of July and so then with you know, a lot of plants once they release their seeds they'll start to senesce and and die back and of course they'll be back the next year but they're they're gone but one of our um, areas of research again like if you burn um, in in mid-July um, maybe about a fifth of those plants will grow back. So maybe the ones that hadn't set seed or were you know, still in different, you know, so which ones actually grow back is, is something we've been, been kind of looking at. But, um, and then the same thing with, with mowing. So we have the, the uh, project with the Oklahoma Department of Transportation and uh, Dennis Martin um, and Landscape um, Architecture. Um, of his department name, horticulture and landscape architecture. I think um, you know, that's one of you know his main areas is is thinking about the the roadsides and vegetation management on those roadsides. And so we've um, and that's another thing for so if you mow, um, and I think mowing a little bit earlier than what you would do for burning to generate regrowth, um, uh, but the plants will regrow and then they'll be there for the the monarchs that come back in in mid August. And so that's. Um, a lot of what we've been been focusing on is thinking about, you know, how do you time those management activities so you'll have milkweed in the fall for those monarchs. And then the harder question, it's a little bit easier when you just want green leaves, right? (laughs) Um, But then if you start thinking about nectar plants too, because they need need nectar as well as, you know, other pollinators need nectar, then the the timing gets a little bit trickier. So how long does it take for a plant to regrow and bloom, right? (laughs) It's a little more complicated than just regrow. So, uh, but, uh, but yes, that's a lot of what we've been focusing on. Um, and then in other areas, and again, our main uh, milkweed plant is one that would, would kind of die back or senesce um, in July, um, or definitely by, by early August. Um, but you know, in other parts of the monarch range, like Texas, there's other species that might um, might bloom later, so they'll be around longer. And, and we do have some here, they're just not as abundant. So like swamp milkweed would be another one where um, where the phonology, the timing is a little bit different, so that means it's around later in the year for for the monarchs, without having to burn or mow or do those other things. And they migrate through here from where to where? 
Um, so the overwintering sites are in Mexico, and I was actually just checking um, Journey North because they um, always report kind of when they start to see the monarchs uh, leave the overwintering grounds. And you know, and there are records of people reporting their first sightings of a monarch uh, already in, in Texas. Um, but there's still a lot on the overwintering grounds, and so they're guessing in the next couple of days um, most of those will be moving northward. So we should be seeing um, seeing our first monarchs, and usually it's um, early April um, is when we report our first, so the very first monarch of the year um, that you see. Um, and sometimes late late uh, March, but usually early early April, and those will be just the very first ones coming through, and then you know more will will fill in as as time goes by. This may be a dumb question. <laughs> does the same one make it all the way? It does. So, so the ones that migrate through in the fall are the ones that go to Mexico in overwinter, and then those same individuals are the ones that that come back. And so, in Oklahoma, you know, so certainly down in in Texas, you know, they're going to be laying eggs, um, and then there's a kind of smaller percent. Um, I think. 10% was, I think, about the last estimate that I remember seeing. But then there are some that will continue to move farther north, um, so kind of the one sweep versus multiple steps. But then those you know, that were laid as eggs in Texas will emerge and then move farther north. And so you also have this um, kind of multi-step migration where their offspring are making that next step. Um, and so by the time you know, we get to the fall, it's the fourth and fifth generation that will be then going down to Mexico. It's hard to imagine one little set of wings going fifteen, what, fifteen hundred miles, two thousand miles. Yes, yes, quite, quite. But quite they just they do. Yeah, and then I guess riding the winds. You know, I think it's not as energetically costly as as one would think. But but still needing to to find some good locations to fuel up along the way. So that's when we'll see a lot of activity in the fall is if the winds shift, so um, you know, there's no point in fighting the winds, right? So <laughs> if, if, if they're uh, not uh, going in the right directions, and we'll have a lot of monarchs that drop down and will be nectaring. Um, and then this past fall was interesting because the it was really spread out. Um, you know, we kind of had some coming through at what we usually call peak migration, but then a lot that were, were still around later. Um, so just given weather conditions and and whatnot, it was kind of a dispersed or spread out migration compared to some years. So we had to, and we are usually out on campus. I don't know if you've seen any of us, <coughs> me or my graduate students, with nets, because we'll do a lot of tagging in the fall. And so I think I and I was kept saying, well, I think this is going to be the last good day. I think this is going to be the last good day. But there were multiple last good days. <laughs> so uh, that we we tagged tagged a lot. So hopefully we'll. Oh, how do you tag it? something that small? Um, and I probably have some tags in, in the other room, but um, but they're little tiny brown stickers, um, and they have a and they're through Monarch Watch, uh, which is what Chip Taylor uh, runs um, out of. Make sure I get the right institution. I think University of Kansas and Lawrence, um, and so it's got a three letter and three number code, um, and so he they have unique numbers for for each year, and I guess um, and they'll have people that go down to the overwintering sites and they'll buy tags from the locals so when they find monarchs and of course at that point you know it's dead monarchs or it might be wings or whatever you happen to to find um, they'll save them and so I think and what I didn't realize is that sometimes they're turning them in like if they miss whoever was there to buy tags they'll turn them in the next year so you might actually get some some returns in, in later years occasionally um, but um, but yes yeah, so you can can order tags and then um, it's a little once you get your method down, you kind of have to very carefully get the, the tag off and not stick it on you, obviously, so you can get it on the butterfly. And, a good, good, and there's a particular location on the hind wing that you um, put it so that they can fly well. But yeah, we'll um, catch a bunch. And we have these little kind of like wax paper envelopes that you can, if you want to catch quite a few. And then we'll, we do other things, uh, measure and um, sample them for a parasite and whatnot. So we bring them back to the lab. And, process a bunch and then send them on their way. So. And have you kept records with yours that some of them actually make it? So last year, so 2015 was the first year that we tagged a lot. Um, and so we had gotten, I think, about 500 tags, but a few we used, like in other states, if we were, were going somewhere. So I think we had about 450 that we tagged in, in Oklahoma. And so we had eight tag recoveries, which sounds really, really low, because that's like, what, 1.7 something percent. But in reality, that's actually really good. So I think one percent is actually what one would expect, and so uh, to get any higher than that is 
just an, an extra added bonus. So, uh, but so yeah, for every 100 or so to get one back is pretty good. So we got, we had eight back and I think six were during peak migration. So in 2015, I think it was October 10th and 11th, where they're just, the wind shifted and we just hit monarchs, you know, all over the place. And I think that year I spent most of my time uh, at my house and a colleague's house and I would just go back and forth you know, and or you you know go in do something, go out to take the garbage out. Ah, there's another 10, 15 monarchs. And, you know, so it was it was pretty easy. But then this past year, my house did not seem very good, <laughs> and there were you know, different things blooming on on campus. And so we, I, I think campus was one of our. And we went to the botanic gardens, and and it was more spread out. And so we tagged at least twice as many, if not more. So we had ordered a bunch more tags, but um, but we had six that were during that peak migration. So we don't know where those came from. They were likely just moving through, you know, so it stopped to nectar, but we had two um, out of about 130 that we collected as um, part of our research is looking at parasitism of the monarch caterpillars. And so we'll collect the late in stars and so the ones that are close to, to going into their chrysalis um, and so that way you can see if they have a fly parasitoid or if they have the um, protozoan. And so we had about 130 of those and we had two that, that two cat tag recoveries. And so that's the first good documentation of you know ones that we knew were laid as eggs in Oklahoma in the fall that then made it to, to Mexico. So that was, that was exciting. So hopefully we'll, and I think we had about twice as many uh, caterpillars um, this, this past fall. So hopefully we'll have some more, so we'll see. Well, do you ever catch some that's already tagged from another? We do source? occasionally, and I have. Um, I mean, especially at the botanic gardens, I'm guessing there was another tagging event because the codes were consecutive. You know, they were close to the same, so it was probably from one one event. But we do, um, and you can report those to to Monarch Watch as well, so knowing kind of where they. And of course, we'll get once you start you know, catching a lot on campus, you, then you go back out the next day and there's still some of the same ones. And so, so we would get some of ours as well. So we try to watch and, and avoid ours so we could get some new ones. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah. well, do they all look alike? All the, all the monarchs look exactly alike or is there some variation in them? There's a good bit of variation. So there's variation in size. Um, and then I guess I don't um, have any... Um, although our, our picture of the monarch on the um, ODOT signs are nice because it's a female. Because so many times when they have a picture of a monarch, it's a male. And they have these two scent glands on the hind wings, and they're kind of these, these dots on the hind wing, and that's how you can tell the two apart. So the females are lacking in those, those, um, those dots, so it's pretty easy. And it's easy to tell when their wings are open, so on the, the back side of the wings. The underside, it's a little bit harder. Um, but you, once you get used to it, you can can easily tell as well. The dots just not as obvious. But yeah, so uh, and occasionally you'll get really tiny ones. You know, like if they, they didn't have enough food and, and they were um, uh, caterpillars, so occasionally you'll just catch one and go, oh, "This is really tiny." But uh, but yeah, so size uh, size and a little bit of color variation as well. But, uh, but well, do other weather conditions like the drought and that sort of thing impact? You know, their size, I guess, or how fast they go or anything like that? Um, definitely all of those those factors could. Um, and, and so for the, the drought, you know, it could influence both the milkweed as well as, as nectar plants. That's and so that's, um, that's kind of the trade-off. Although I will say um, one of my previous projects on uh, that ended up having a very strong, it was a uh, roadside monarch focus, was it was in a, what would the years have been? I'd have to count backwards but um, but you know I think it was 11 and 12 but anywhere it was really dry in, in Oklahoma and so there was really nothing on the roadsides they were just brown but there was the milkweed so um, so you know a lot of so it is pretty drought tolerant to some degree um, and so that was one of the reasons we had for that project um, you know added a, a specific monarch parasite um, component because there was at least milkweed, even if everything else was <laughs> was uh, just brown and dense. <laughs> so, uh, well, then the other thing that comes to mind that might or might not impact them is the wind turbines that they were that's showing up everywhere. Did that change the wind pattern for them, or do they fly that high or what? So, and, and they do fly really high. So a lot of times, you know, once they're they're truly migrating. Um, so yeah, so the winds can make make a big big difference and. In, in, especially during during migration. 
just have to learn to uh, dodge those areas like Woodward, <laughs> where all the wind farms are. Well, oh, oh, so wind farms in particular, and I guess that's one thing where we don't know a whole lot, like the effect of wind farms on insects. It's just, um, you know, I know they do have to go clean the blades on occasion um, because they have a buildup of debris, so whether that debris is, is insects or other things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but presumably, and you know, thinking about cars and other, other types of things, um, you know, that's one where we don't know a whole lot about, about um, what that effect would be on, on monarchs. But, um, but yeah, so, um, uh, but they would, you know, in a lot of conditions, they would be flying pretty high, so above what you would, would expect for, for wind farms or even um, cars you know, during a, a large part of their well, how do they, or do you know how they do their directions? I mean, how do they know they're going, going south? south? Yeah. So, um, so in a, in a lot of insects, do do something similar. So, in terms of um, if you think about uh, the orientation of the sun and, and you know those that changing uh, daylight length would be one of the, the factors that would kind of contribute to uh, starting that migration period as well. But uh, but yeah, they use a lot of. Of, of different cues to, to, and I think they end up in, in very different locations because a lot of it would depend on wind. So whether it's, you know, more east or west, depending on how that migration flows is influenced by kind of external factors, but still end up in the same location every year. So approximately. So, <laughs> so have you been to, the, to Mexico to the winter? Time? I have not. I would love to go sometime. But. I can't imagine all those in one plot, in one spot. I, would be fascinating to see. It, and, and they are kind of overlapping. I guess they call it shingling. So you know that's how there's millions of of mm -hmm. monarchs in a in a hectare of, of overwintering grounds. But well, besides the elements and their natural lifespan, is there anything else that feeds on them? Quite mm -hmm. There's actually lots of things that eat uh, monarchs, and I think. Um, and uh, Catalina Trail, who was on the cover of National Geographic for, you know, first finding the, the monarchs way back, uh, what year was that? I should know that, but, uh, but many years ago, so finding the overwintering sites. Um, and I guess the cattle will actually, when there's nothing else there, you know, they'll be, but, um, but the monarchs will lose some of the cardenolite concentrations over time, so, you know, while they're overwintering, so they would be less toxic. And then there's birds that are uh, able to, to deal with the, their toxicity, and so there are birds on the overwintering grounds that pick them off as well. Um, and you know, caterpillars, if you think about starting from an egg and going to an adult butterfly, you know, only five to seven percent are gonna make it. So there's lots of things that, that eats monarchs along the way. Um, so you know, there's wasps that will, um, and then we study one of our uh, main things we study is a decayed fly parasitoid, and so you know, some years. Um, you know, we're collecting the, the fourth and fifth in stars, the late in stars, but, you know, we've had up to you know, half of them, half the Tikkanid fly um, parasitoid. So there's lots of things that will, you know, there's assassin bugs and uh, lots of things that, that eat, eat monarchs, surprisingly enough. So, <laughs> so. You can tell I don't know much. I'm learning as we go here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so very, very low survival from, from egg, to, egg to adults. So. So when we see one, we're actually pretty lucky. Yes, yes. And I understand their numbers have been decreasing? They have. So we had, um, so this past year, and I was going to try to count back, but if you think about the last five years, those first three of those when we had the really, really low numbers. So, uh, in, you know, very, very low numbers on the overwintering grounds. And then the winter for 15, 16 was a lot better, um, but then there was a winter storm um, on St. Patrick's Day that, um, so before they came back last spring, that, that did, um, and it wasn't clear at the time what the impact was, but that's also thought to be one of the reasons that it had dropped some this past year, so the, the numbers had dropped. But um, I think we, it was just under three hectares, so what they do is they'll fly over the overwintering grounds and they'll estimate the number of hectares that are covered. Um, and then they convert hectares into number of monarchs. And I think they usually multiply by 50 million. So for every hectare, you've got about 50 million monarchs. Um, but, I mean, you can think about a single winter storm event can knock out, you know, a huge percentage of those. So even though it sounds like a lot, it's not actually a whole lot. 
Um, but you know, so this year it was just under three, um, but the conservation target is to try to get to six hectares and leave about twice as many, and that would not eliminate, but at least reduce the chances of you know having an event that would um, potentially lead towards um, loss of that uh, migratory population. And so that's the importance of all of this. Yes, <laughs> and you have some uh, other teammates that are working to help change various aspects of this story. We do. There's a whole lot of, and there's way more people interested than there would have been a few years ago. So, <laughs> so um, uh, it's the monarchs currently being considered for listing as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and that's triggered a flurry of activities. <laughs> and so, there's um, uh, been a, a lot of, of different things going on, and so, a lot of the states throughout the migratory route are. Um, have either developed or in the process of kind of developing their plan. So the idea, I guess, is to, um, you know, if we can go ahead and address those issues and, and have a lot of activity on the ground, um, then that might not um, make it necessary to list them, um, you know, so we can go ahead and have an impact. And it is one where, you know, there's lots that can be done that makes that potentially easier than, you know, other species that have been, been considered for, for listing. Um, and so kind of figuring out you know, what people are doing and where, or even documenting, you know, all of these activities is, is kind of one of the, the challenges. And so, um, so there's been a, a lot going on, you know, when you talk to, to Jane Breckenridge, you know, putting milkweed out there on the landscape, so her project with um, uh, Chip Taylor and, and the tribes, and so, you know, again, creating, creating habitat, so adding more habitat. Even though we've got I think more habitat or good habitat in the, the south than they do in the upper Midwest. I mean, they have pretty well documented milkweed losses there. And so we don't really know if there has been a loss, um, but given the landscape, so about a third of the landscape in Oklahoma and Texas is going to be grasslands. And so that's where you would expect, you know, so at least it's not crop or something where you, you would exclude milkweed which is the issue in the upper Midwest. Um, so we do have a lot of good habitat, but then even if you have good habitat, if you've got gaps in that habitat, then the monarchs aren't going to be able to lay all of their eggs, and so you're not getting the maximum reproduction that you, you could have. So kind of thinking about, you know, are there areas that we need to fill in uh, with additional uh, milkweed would be one of those, and then you know, thinking about nectar plants and, and kind of adding those. In as well, and, and I think a lot of what we can do in Oklahoma you know, has to do with, with management. So when you talk to you know, Bob Hamilton, and they, um, you know, being up at the uh, northern edge of the state, they start getting some other milkweed species as well. So they have some common milkweed, and they have Sullivan's milkweed, which looks kind of similar, but they've got you know, kind of some very beautiful areas that, that have, um, have a good bit of milkweed. So it's worth going in, in this spring when it's all in bloom to... Uh, to see all of that. And then when you move into Kansas, you know, again, kind of the milkweed species um, shift some. But, um, but yes, and there's been, been a lot of activity, um, you know, in a lot of, of groups, you know, a lot of um, urban efforts and, you know, kind of just across the board. Um, I think there is a lot of support, because from a lot of perspectives, you know, what is good for monarchs is good for a lot of grassland species. So it's kind of an easy, um, easy thing to get on board with. I think for the for the most part. So. Yeah, I was reading there's some program with mayors or something. I didn't. Uh, did you know anything about that? <laughs> um, I, I do. So the um, uh, National Wildlife Federation has a project where they're um, getting I guess cities to commit to, and they have a list of activities to participate in. So so um, you know trying to to get cities on board in terms of providing habitat for for monarchs and so Oklahoma City um, I think there I think there's been more activity in Oklahoma but Oklahoma City was the the first group that kind of um, started that for for Oklahoma but there's been a, a lot more activity since then but yeah a lot of, of interest in uh, you know thinking about um, community gardens and school gardens and just what what people can do um, in terms of providing milkweed and nectar nectar sources and is cooperative extension involved with any of that um, so, so, so from the extension perspective, um, you know, thinking about um, uh, like so for grazing or rangelands or burning, you know, a lot of a lot of those activities, um, and, and it, it actually fits really well with quail too. So, um, you know, so a lot of wildlife, you know, efforts to provide habitat for wildlife on these more um, 
semi-natural but managed, you know, grasslands um, uh, is very they're very complementary. So you know, some of the seed sources that quail use are also good nectar plants, and you know, the cover quail need would be good nesting habitat for some of the native bees that rely on on uh, wood to nest in. You know, so a lot of a lot of nice kind of overlap between those those two as well. So again. Um, uh, it, it, so like uh, Quail Forever and Pheasants Forever has been actively involved in a lot of the pollinator work again because it's so complementary. Um, so it's easy to kind of make those those connections. And I noticed uh, just looking around that there's a festival or two around the state for monarchs. So. And oh, probably okay. more to come. So. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it's just because it's easy, easily identifiable butterfly. I mean, there's all kinds of butterflies. Why, why the monarch? Yes. Well, and then a lot of people you know, have have their monarch stories. And again, it's disappointing. I don't have a have a monarch story, but um, but you know, a lot of people you'll talk to, and they'll talk about when they um, they've been seeing like you know the big um, roof sites. So in the fall, when they're migrating south, um, they'll stop at locations and um, kind of aggregate. So there'll be groups of them, and so you'll have you know some uh, groups of trees covered with with monarchs. And so people you know mention. I was going to stop and take a picture, but I figured I would see it again. Or I mean, so everybody's a lot of people have their their monarch story, or they're rearing caterpillars when they were younger, and and so it's definitely one that I think kind of kind of brings people together, and and a lot, and a lot of people have have their their stories, so more so than a lot of, of other insects or butterflies. And then there's highway no way stations. Way stations, and I registered my um, home garden. I think last year, so I have my. Uh, I forgot what number I was, but uh, uh, but and, and that's also through Monarch Watch that does the, the tagging program. And so they've got a form where you can go fill out. And they ask you know how many milkweed plants do you have, and which species, and what about nectar, and how big is it, and you're know, making sure you're not applying pesticides and, and things like that. But um, and they've started. I think now they have a, a map where you can see all the. The way stations, um, but yeah, that's a, a very nice, nice program. And again, you know, kind of thinking about uh, what's out there, and, and a lot of people have have contributed, in, and yeah, I think more and more are being registered all the time. So. Well, what's in yours? What do you have in yours? Well, um, so and I have some of the native milkweed, the Asclepias viridis, um, and it hasn't. It, it, natives take a while to establish, so I think I've had mine. This will be the third year. Um, so it hasn't bloomed yet, um, you know, but the plants have, have gotten bigger. And then um, I've got a lot of what I have at Bustani's. I don't know if you've been to Bustani's. So if you go um, um, south on Perkins Road, um, out of town, but anyway, they've got a, a, a nursery out there. And um, Steve has a lot of um, different native plants. And so, and I, and I like, and it sometimes doesn't go over as well in, in urban environments, but I like a lot of vertical structure. So, um, so I have um, Salvia azuria, which is blue sage, um, and it blooms late in the year, and, and the bees love it, and, and the monarchs use it from time to time. And I've got some um, golden rods would be another good one. I have compass plant, which I was very excited about, um, um, and I, I like it because of the leaves. It's got these really so, um, and it shoots up the stalk towards the, the end of the season. But it's got these really interesting looking leaves and um, Leatris would be another another good one for, for monarchs and so I tried to have stuff that would um, so for monarchs you know you want kind of the spring and the fall pulling me but then for native bees you know kind of filling in throughout the year as well so um, but I've accumulated a variety of things over the years so so, uh, so it's not a food garden for people it's a food garden for for, for yeah. pollinators, yes, yes, yes. And I guess that's the, the other challenge when you want stuff that blooms throughout the year, you have to be okay with the fact that it's not blooming for the other part of the year, right? So it's just green and um, so, and, and they are um, yeah, native plants. So I think some of my neighbors have maybe thought, you know, they just looked kind of weedy, but then once it blooms, they're like, oh, that's really nice after all. So, <laughs> so but yeah, people always like stuff that's blooming all the time or, uh, but, uh, but yeah. The true butterfly bushes that are pretty purple in the spring. Yeah, yeah, and last for quite a, quite a while. So, uh, do you travel up and down the migration path to do some of your research, or is it mostly just Oklahoma? 
It's mostly been Oklahoma up until this past year, so we have some projects in Texas now, which is exciting because you're thinking about that, that last generation in the fall breeding monarchs. Um, you know, it's primarily the southern region, so getting an idea of what it's like farther south is, is really exciting. And then Texas, um, you know, I think areas there's more, um, and maybe not, um, and I guess, well, Texas would be big, so they do have more milkweed diversity, but they tend to be more interspersed, so a lot of our sites will have multiple um, milkweed species, and again, it's just based on soil types, and um, and so um, and so that's anyway, been kind of interesting, and then, of course, when you go farther south, too, there's concern about fire ants um, having a potential impact on, on monarchs, um, so... Uh, just because they are so ubiquitous where they, they do occur. But um, so that's kind of another interesting avenue for uh, that we're starting to do a couple projects on as well. And I would love to, to go a little bit farther north too to, to Kansas, in particular the, the Flint Hills region is some beautiful habitat. Um, and, uh, some a different stand, environment altogether. Yeah, beautiful me. stands of milkweed. So, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe if it wasn't weed on the end of it, people might feel yeah, a little and, better with it. You know, and, and, and so when you do get farther north, when it shifts more to common milkweed, or you know that it'll spread via rhizomes, and so you do get kind of these stands of it. And you know, it can be tall, uh, you know, quite tall. But you know, for us, the the green milkweed, I mean, you have to get down on your hands and knees, and and it's just individual dispersed plants. And so I really feel like you know some of the issues and why. Um, why milkweed was removed from from crop fields? I mean, it was, you know, it was a problem. It was tall, and <laughs> you know, so, but, but you know, down here, I think, you know, just with our different milkweed species, it's less of an issue. So it's just one component of the the habitat, but it's you know doesn't have the same issues that that I think common milkweed had more in the, the upper Midwest. So again, kind of dispersed um, plants that are just spread out and not you know, densely aggregated or or creating any problems anywhere. So. Is that Roundup Ready been a problem? Is that, that, I mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah, so for the Roundup Ready corn and soybeans in particular, I think that's been the main um, factor attributed to milkweed loss in the upper mid Midwest. So, and, and uh, so that'd be the late 90s um, when those were developed. And so, um, and uh, some of the previous research had suggested that milkweed production, so the number of caterpillars you were getting out of an area, was actually higher in those crop fields. You know, prior to that Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, and so that's been, been I think one of the, the biggest challenges for that that region. Um, but again, it's it's a, a very different um, milkweed plant than, than the ones that we have for the most part down here. So. It's all interrelated somehow. It's all interrelated. <laughs> so yeah, and everybody likes to say that common milkweed is the most important milkweed plant for monarchs. But I always like to point out if they don't make it through the south. They don't make it to the common milkweed, so I would argue that our, our uh, green milkweed is probably you know Oklahoma and Texas. I mean, it's their first and their last um, stop, so you gotta have it too. So I don't think we can be second. Maybe we can tie and it'd be equal. But, uh, <laughs> so we should all have a pot in our front yard with one plant in it. Would that do any good? Um, it could, and again, if you think about that idea that you know. It's, they need to disperse their, their eggs, but it would be ideal, and they do um, eat quite a bit. Um, and, you know, again, our native milkweeds are much smaller than, than common milkweed. And so it'd be good to have, you know, we could go with maybe 10 plants for everyone's. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, if you only have one and you end up with four or five eggs, you, you know, if they make it, you might not have enough food. So they, they, they can be quite hungry. Yeah, and once they're they're fifth in stars, they do eat quite a bit. So I and but sure. not other not other living insects. It's they eat all of it's milkweed. Yeah. 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 All so, milkweed. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Plus the nectar. As adults. as adults, as adults. But the, oh. the and the caterpillars will they'll eat the flower buds and they'll even eat sometimes the if the seed pods aren't like if there's green and not very um, not too far along in development you'll see them. So they they like all parts of the milkweed. Well, then they're taking care of the milkweed, milkweed problem, if you look at it that way, too, if they're going to eat all of them. Just eat lots of caterpillars to eat up your milkweed. So. <laughs> but not too many, because you don't want anybody not to have enough food. So, <laughs> so uh, that's a challenge. Yeah, it's a balance in that. Mm -hmm. Well, what's your next, what's your next project? 
are coming up, or what are you involved in now? Let's, let's go back and do that instead. Um, well, and I have um, several students that are, are finishing um, this semester. Um, one of them did a, a kind of urban monarch project around Stillwater, which is, um, she's got some interesting results that she'll be presenting um, soon. And we have just people that were interested in participating, so we're trying to figure out you know, how to kind of continue that. But you know, when your students graduate, it makes it a little more challenging. Um, and then um, my other student had done the, the roadside um, work, um, uh, which will continue as well with our, our mowing plots that we have in collaboration with um, the Oklahoma Department of, of Transportation. Um, and, uh, and we just started some work in Texas this past fall was our first field season down there. Um, and uh, one of my students is going down in a couple of weeks, um, again, thinking about that, that fire ant issue. We've got some, some sites uh, where they're going to do some fire ant control. So we'll kind of large scale, so we'll be able to compare sites with and without control. So that should be interesting. Um, and we have quite a few other things that are starting up. I'm not sure I can even exactly remember them all. We have a lot like in terms of, of monitoring um, throughout the state, like looking at restoration practices and the response um, to those practices in terms of pollinator habitat. So we have um, uh, one of the competitive state wildlife grants um, in collaboration with um, Texas. So um, that will be working on soon and we've got some more roadside stuff coming up. I have a project with the joint venture and the University of Minnesota where we'll be uh, kind of looking more broad scale at roadsides and trying to help the departments of transportation uh, figure out uh, kind of recommendations for, for what to do with different roadsides. Um, and then again, um, kind of thinking about what we have and where so that we have um, some national Monarch monitoring efforts. Um, so we have these protocols. There's a group called the Monarch Conservation Science Partnership, and so it's uh, a lot of USGS, US Fish and Wildlife, and then um, academics, depending on you know what their area is, and then you know all the people associated with the citizen scientist projects. And so we've been trying to develop a consistent monitoring protocol so that way data can be collected in a similar way throughout, and that would help inform the uh, national level modeling efforts for you know, trying to model uh, what's going on with the with the monarchs and so um, and I guess we did some sampling last year and in, in, um, actually it was mostly Oklahoma but it will be Texas and then we've got other sites where we're doing something similar but it's designed a little bit differently but complementary um, because the question's a little bit different you know response to restoration practices and so there is lots going on <laughs> it's kind of a crazy time it so. sounds like it and I'm trying to back in my head when did you get started on this five or six years ago or further back than that further back I guess um yes yeah, so I guess and I guess I started with the native bee sampling right when I got here um, and then you know the very next year was when we we were interested in monarchs I mean it always takes a little bit to get started and um and in particular uh, you know, there isn't much about that that last generation. So, and that's one of the big questions I think for the South is is that generation important? Because there are things we could do to support it if it is. Um, and I think uh, you know, it, odds are it's either going to be positive or negative. Um, so the concern would be, and I think in Oklahoma because we don't have any monarchs that are going to overwinter. It gets too cold. All the milkweed's going to die back. But when you get down to Texas and along the Gulf Coast in particular, um, and there's um, tropical milkweed, so it's not a native, but it's one that a lot of people have planted in, in you know home gardens because you can buy it, and it's the one with the pretty, actually it's the one in this picture, um, but you know with the orange and red and yellow flowers, um, and so there's concern in Texas that um, that monarchs are starting to overwinter. And there's a parasite that builds up in the population when they're there for extended periods of time. And so um, yeah, that's one of the concerns with that last generation, too, is if it's contributing to that um, overwintering population or not. So, you know, it could be at, at some point south, it could be a negative, but we have native milkweeds that are, are common during that time period. So, um, so that's kind of one of the big questions is, how important is it, and then are there negative implications, and again, related to this non-native milkweed species that might need to be addressed. But, 
Well, it's the Mexico winter ground safe. I mean, are they on the verge of, are they been threatened? Been threatened by um, and there was a lot of illegal logging, and there are still okay. issues, and with storm events too, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, that, but... and there is concern too that the microclimate is you know, very suitable for monarchs, and so you know, if you think of conditions, if it's you know, going to be warmer down there, is it going to become less suitable, you know, kind of things like that. And if, if it does become less suitable, are there areas that the monarchs could, can move to? And, you know, those are big questions that, yeah, we don't really know the answer to. But I think a lot of the issues, I mean, there's been a lot of effort to address the issues on the overwintering grounds in terms of, you know, habitat loss. Um, um, and, of course, as with anywhere, there's always continues to be issues, but I think they've done a lot to to solve a lot of those, those issues. But again, still many challenges to come. So. Global warming, they came in there? That was my subtle um, <laughs> warming <laughs> temperatures. <laughs> I didn't know if I would be, uh, yeah, yeah they didn't if I mentioned that. So, uh, but, but yeah, that is, is one of the big concerns. And then thinking about the different generations too. Um, so one of the thoughts while we don't have monarchs typically during the summer is you know, that it's too warm for them. Um, you know, it all in development periods take you know longer when it's colder and they're shorter when it's hotter, and so you know what that means for milkweed distributions and monarchs on their breeding grounds is another another big question. So, uh, About how cold can they stand? I mean, how, how and so. I just read a paper on that, and it was much colder than I expected. And I know um, for our Texas project, uh, you know, we're looking at the last generation, but then also uh, ones that are overwintering on the coast and again, it's areas where there's predominantly tropical milkweed. Um, and David went down in January and it was after they had a freeze. So it had knocked back a lot of the milkweed because it was literally, I mean, I think later in the week where you know, they'd had the freeze earlier when he was down there. And so, and he found caterpillars and there were still adults, you know, flying around. And so, um, so, uh, so I think, how extended that freezing period is, is is what matters a lot as well. So they can do okay with with short periods of time, but um, but longer periods are. And a little bit different topic too is they their butterfly farms. Now yeah. people are selling, growing growing them or selling them or shipping them for events like weddings and funerals and stuff like that. That's a recent occurrence or fairly recent. Are they? I don't know much about that. Um, and I, it's not an area I know a lot about either, but it is, um, uh, and I, you know, I think it's been going on for quite some time, and there's probably good ways to do that and not so good ways to do that. So, um, and that parasite would be one of the concerns as well. But, um, and so it's it's called um, Ophriocystes electroscura, and OE is the uh, short version. But when the butterflies are infected, um, it's a spore-forming protist, so they have all these spores all over their body, and so then when they go and lay eggs, they'll leave some spores behind, and the caterpillars eat the spores, and that's how they get infected. And so one of the concerns with the um, you know, different breeding programs would be making sure that it's sterile and that you're not doing things that would increase infection. So in particular, if you're releasing you know, butterflies that are infected, that would then lead to a higher infection in the overall population if they're laying eggs in um, the same location that uninfected females are, and then all of those caterpillars end up being infected. Um, and then, of course, the other issue is um, you know, kind of genetic diversity, and you know, if you're releasing them into the environment. So there, there could certainly be ways, you know, in terms of um, addressing some of those issues. Um, and I don't know how well different um, different breeders do that, but I, you know, I think there could be ways on addressing both of those to, to some degree. But, and I guess where you would ship them to perhaps could be a narrow, narrower focus to I would imagine them. there's regulations on shipping that, that, that type of thing too. And I think Monarchs are one that is has been allowed to be shipped. I mean, I think there were a limited number of, of um, butterflies that you could ship for release at weddings and whatnot. Um, and if they, and I think that was part of that listing petition had some uh, cons in there about, and so that would be something that would need to be addressed if they were to be listed. But, um, well, do you breed them? You don't. Um, so we typically just have caterpillars in the lab, you know, when we've just collected them in the field and then 
if they survive, if they don't have flies, or you know, then we'll release them. Um, and we have occasionally, um, and it's kind of a whole operation to try to be set up to, you know, breed them, and you know, but there are, um, you know, researchers that a lot of their research is based on needing to have a lab population that you can then do do experiments with. And we've occasionally done a couple things, but um, but it takes a lot of work. <laughs> so um, and then you have to be careful. Um, they don't lay too many eggs, so you have what you want and not too many caterpillars to feed since you've probably got a limited stock of milkweed in the greenhouse and, and whatnot. So it's a lot easier um, said than done, but there are some interesting projects one can do with um, if one keeps monarchs in the lab, but you know, we haven't put effort into that so far. So. <laughs> well, and their so. lifespan is short from can, can well, compared to other things, I mean, what, four or five weeks, something like that? So in the summer, it's pretty short, um, and this might be getting into way too much detail, but you can keep them, you can cool them down and kind of keep them at their developmental zero and, like, get them out and feed them, you know, honey water every couple of days, and then they can live much longer. So people that do keep them in the lab for research purposes, they, again, have to, and it's very elaborate routines and, you know, procedures that they have worked out to, to be able to, to do all that. A lot of work. So. <laughs> so. I keep coming back to this song in my head with Dolly Parton. You know, love is like a butterfly. Yeah, a flutter. And I think they have a butterfly, a boring or whatever the word it might be at Dollywood and Pigeon Forge, or they did at one time, but I don't know if they still do. But I guess other places across the country do that too, have butterfly displays. They do, and I'm not sure. I think at least. And I don't know if it's, it might just be seasonal, but I'm pretty sure I don't know if one or both of our zoos have a butterfly display. I think at least one does. My 15-year-old is too old to go to the zoo now. So and it's seasonal, you would think, in April or September, what, what would be seasonal? Yeah, well, because that's what I was wondering, is if it was a, in a condition where it could be kept year-round, oh, because you'd have to have a, you know, it warmed. But, um, but, um, but I'm pretty sure that I've, and it might be both locations now, but I'm not absolutely sure. It's hard to remember what, because it was quite a few years ago that I've been to, but I think, I think there are some available. So, I mean, and then, I mean, that would be one potential number you would order the chrysalises and then have them emerge. And so I think that's what most of them do versus trying to have caterpillars and host plants. And so they would have, um, and a lot of times I think tropical species that, so they're, contained in their environment. So. Well, what is it about them that fascinates you? And is there one aspect of it that just, you know, intrigues? So in, in the very broad context, um, a lot of what I do, I'm interested in, in land use and management and the effects on species. And so I kind of do similar things, like for example, with the native bees. I ask very similar questions. Um, and then I have gotten quite obsessed with um, the parasite interactions. I mean, it's just, it, and part of it was, um, you know, originally we wanted to study OE. So for that one, you know, if you collect the light in stars and then you rear them in the lab when they're adults, you can test them for OE. It's, um, it's a non-invasive method where you just press a piece of tape gently against the abdomen and it will pull off some of the butterfly scales. And then if it has the OE, it shows up as these kind of like little black dots in the in the background. Um, and so we wanted to study OE, um, and so that way you could, by collecting them as instars, you could relate that to the land use and the management, right? So is, is it higher or lower if you're in a you know, rangeland or a roadside or if it's mowed or if it's burned? Um, but then, and I think I told this joke many a time during a presentation, and I don't think anybody ever laughs, but now I always say that I've told the joke and no one ever laughs, so then people laugh. I set them up to make sure that they laugh, right? But the first time I did it was actually at an entomology conference. And I'm like, how could people not laugh? But so I would say, so we were we wanted to study OE, but then they kept dropping like flies because they had flies, right? <laughs> and it is a phrase, I think, dropping like flies. But um, but uh, uh, but yeah, you know, so we ended up having, almost having to study the flies because we had more fly parasitism. Uh, you know, again, we were losing a lot more than than what we had for. OE. And so again, thinking about that land use and that management, and is there, um, you know, are there interactions there that lead to higher or lower parasitism? Um, I think is from the ecology perspective is some is really really interesting. So we've gotten um, 
do a lot along those lines, both with the monarchs and starting to do that with the native bees as well, with like twig nesting traps and looking at nest success. So you can see that monarchs may not be the only thing that you study from here on out into here. Yeah, and I, and I really enjoy doing the monarch work, and in particular, I mean, there's just, it's so satisfying when you are out in the field and you find those big, thick end stars, and there's just something very gratifying about it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't say that I just study monarchs to study monarchs. Um, they happen to kind of fit within my bigger picture. But, um, and, you know, the more you're out there, um, you know, I originally was out there for native bees, and then the monarchs are of interest, and then there's a... Another really hairy, kind of orange, fuzzy caterpillar on the uh, milkweed plants. And so, you know, it all takes time. But I have a, another one of my students who's graduating this semester study those caterpillars. And so they have um, their own parasites. And, um, you know, but their, their host plant is also the milkweed. They're uh, called the unexpected cystia moth. Um, and so they have these. Um, but anyway, so that's, but it just keeps evolving and there's always more things to do. So. So a lot of your work is under a microscope? Well, not, not, I guess to look at, at the parasites, for example, but, um, but a lot of it, you know, a lot of our time is mostly in the, in the field, so, uh, which is the fun part. Well, they, and they did a control burn in Pawnee County yesterday, and then all that smoke came this Is way. that what that was? Okay. Yeah. okay. So I wondered if you're headed that way to see what pops up. I should, I should go. So, uh, yeah, yeah, the control burn in Pawnee County. Butterflies. So you said late and star what? What specific? Is that the female or what so, when you say that? So for the caterpillars, they go through five different instar stages. So the egg hatches and you have your first instar, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And then the fifth is the one that goes into that J formation before it forms the chrysalis. Um, and so we always just collect you know, the fourth and fifth so that way they've had time to be parasitized in the field or consume OE spores or, or whatnot. So that's why we've always done late ones. But that's also another interesting question that will maybe shift gears in the future um, to know like, well, what in star stage do they get parasitized at? So if we started collecting for a second, but, you know, then we would be able to answer those questions as well. So that would be very interesting too. But you don't have to feed them as long when they're fifth in stars, right? So, <laughs> so they, they're, because they're about done with the milkweeds. So. Well, how many eggs does one butterfly lay? They can lay several hundred, um, at least, if, if not more. And so normally they would lay in a natural environment, you know, one egg per plant, and they would continue moving. Um, in an urban environment, so like home gardens, you know, a lot of times you do find a whole lot of eggs on plants, and I think. You know, it's such a different structure, and I have no data to back it up, so I will admit that I'm making this up. But you know, I think the movement patterns are very different in urban environments, and so you know, a lot of times I think they end up kind of coming back to where they started from. You know, so if you think about you know big open field and moving along versus you know where you've got houses and fences, and so I think they you know, keep finding the same plants. You know, in particular when there's not much there, right? And so um, so you can get egg dumping where you'll end up with a whole bunch of, of eggs on a plant um, and you see that with other butterflies as, as well but um, but yes you usually think about them coming and so in the field you know occasionally you might find a couple eggs on one plant but you know for the most part it's one per plant are they territorial I mean but more another butterfly come in behind and lay an egg besides the first egg um, and so there's not and I guess there's been a little bit done but not much on you know what do they do you know, during the breeding season. And so the males kind of patrol, so they might stay more in an area, but I think the females tend to move more through, again, finding more host plants as they go. So, um, but yes, but you do somewhat, um, you know, once they're out of that migratory mode, um, some that stay in a location, but very broadly, you know, much larger than a yard or, or something. So. Yeah, it's fascinating just... How much you know in your head <laughs> too about all these little little things, little things we don't think about on a normal day. Pollinators too. I mean, they, they help with the. What do they like the butter the monarchs? What are the particular plants they? Are you gonna ask about monarch pollination? Yes. Okay, and I and I actually just take on this question 
earlier this week, but they are not good pollinators. <laughs> so, um, you know, we always tend to think about, you know, we're selling everything as we need pollination, but butterflies, and there are some exceptions, but butterflies in general are not considered good pollinators and, and, and monarchs are, are not. And so if you think about like the milkweed plants, you know, it's primarily bees um, and larger body bees that are going to be moving. And uh, milkweed plants have these um, kind of pollen sacs that actually get stuck on the bees, so it's not loose pollen grains; it's, they're contained in these in these sacs, and so um, and so they kind of get stuck, and they have this whole mechanism for you know how then when they land on the next flower to reach the nectar, you know, they kind of get trapped, and so they end up moving the, the pollen around. But yeah, butterflies are, are not tend not to be great pollinators, um, and, and so monarchs would not be. But native bees, on the other hand, so a lot of what we do for monarchs will be beneficial for the native bees, which which would be our main, main pollinators. Well, then the question would be, what purpose do they serve, I guess? Um, and that's always a good, and so we could say, again, relate to that same purpose that providing good habitat for monarchs is providing good habitat for those bees that are good pollinators. Okay. Um, uh, uh, but again, you know, I think something people can relate to, and then again, you know, that idea of, of grassland management being beneficial to a whole lot of other species, you know, birds and um, you know, other insects and small mammals and you know, kind of that whole suite of, of the community that, that needs that habitat. Well, it's the symbolism too, I guess, to some extent, yeah. that, what that represents. And it's at least something people can, can get behind more so than, than others. And that migration is very, uh, very unique. So there are other monarch populations throughout the world. So it's not likely that the monarch itself would go extinct, but that whole, um, and even in the U.S., we've got, I guess, three populations of monarchs. We've got the eastern migratory population, which is kind of, would you know, come through Texas, and then it's you know, kind of the whole east. But there's a population in South Florida that's there year-round, so it's breeding, and, and they have really high levels of OE infection because they're there year-round. And then there's also the western uh, monarch population, and there is movement between all three of these, so they're not genetically dissimilar, you know, by any means. But um, but then they overwinter, um, you know, along the coast in, in California. But um, you know, so one of the biggest concerns too is you could lose that migration phenomenon because you know that's kind of what what a lot of the issue is 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 thinking about that that migration. So uh, so it's so it's a little bit yeah interesting to to think about preserving a phenomenon versus uh, versus an individual species. But it translates into environmental concerns too, so I can see that. Yeah, I think it's very nice too in terms of recognizing you know, that there aren't state or, you know, country or, I mean, those boundaries are meaningless for a lot of conservation efforts, right? So, um, and so, you know, a lot of what needs to be done needs to cross those boundaries. So. Well, on the flip side for OSU, it's the right color. So it what? is the right color, and I was kind of—I was—I think I've promoted before. We should only support those who study orange and black animals, right? <laughs> so, so the the cystia caterpillars, you know, are, are orange, and, and their hairs can be kind of dark sometimes. So orange and black as well. I don't know how many other things there would be out there, but uh, so I'm self-promoting all the way on that one. So. <laughs> Stretch honeybees are close. Or bumblebees are yeah. almost orange. There are some bumblebees that would, yeah, would have a little bit more. And the fire ants, they're, are they they're, are they red? So they're, and so the red imported fire ant, but they can be on a gradient from a kind of black to black to red. And they're a threat because they eat the eggs or eat the, or eat the caterpillars or what? So we actually don't know much, but that is a big concern. So if you look at the quarantine zone for um, red imported fire ants, it's pretty much the whole region where there's the first generation of monarchs and so um, and I don't actually remember when fire ants first arrived but that is one of the concerns and there's been like a couple studies there was one good study which I guess is a book chapter um, but in Texas where they did some I guess five meter um, enclosures and so they had higher survival inside where fire ants were mostly excluded you know versus outside but again if you think about if only five to seven are going to make it to adulthood anyway, it takes an awful lot to really get a good handle on it. Um, and so one alternative, so you could think fire ants could be bad, or it could be that they remove a lot of the other predators. Uh, you know, so, so, so yeah, it's, it's kind of, but an area where, um, and again, what you could do to control fire ants would be 
challenging. I mean, it would be a challenging issue to address if it is identified as, as having a big impact. But that is one area um, of current interest to try to try to address the, the monarch concerns and, and see if that's a contributing factor or not. So. I guess one answer starts you on another path down. Answer another question. Yes. Yes. One leads to the other. So when you were back in elementary school, did you ever imagine you'd be studying butterflies? No, nope. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't collect them and for 4-H or whatever? Yeah, did I did collect, collect stuff, you know, but uh, but yeah, but not. I not don't think I did. Class. I don't think I did insects either, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Given my, uh, that's my focus now, primarily. Are you the main one on campus that does this? Just uh, with the monarchs, particularly in particular. Um, I think from from that particular perspective, um, I don't know if you've met Mark Fishbein. He's in plant biology, ecology, and evolution. So it was was botany, just like we were zoology, right? Everybody changed their name, but um, but um, but he works with milkweeds um, primarily from the evolutionary plant defense perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, you know, I think be interested in monarchs as an herbivore, you know, in terms of that plant defense perspective. But Mark was my, uh, when well, we did the science cafe, um, but he's, um, and he's the director of the OSHU herbarium, but he would know a whole lot about, um, you know, in terms of milkweed distributions and, and things like that. But, uh, but yeah, so he's um, a milkweed guy, if we can put him in that category. Um, and there's, you know, maybe a few other people that do kind of plant insect interactions and When can you buy milkweed seeds? Do you just have to go find your pasture? You and dig can, them up? and you know it's one where I think you know, there hasn't been a lot of demand for native milkweeds, and so it's pretty limited. Um, and so that is what you know one of the issues with trying to increase habitat, and then you know wanting to provide seeds from that general vicinity, right? So you wouldn't want to like plant seeds from Texas, you know, even if the milkweed occurs there up here I mean, because it's just so you wouldn't expect that to do as well so you kind of want the same ecotype from the same general vicinity but um um but to i think jane's project um with the tribes you know they've been trying to collect seeds and um and i think they've got some really fancy hoop houses um uh in, you know and again kind of with all the focus and nectar plants too so um but it's it is challenging um you know thinking about and there's you know if you wanted to collect you know, maybe it's just one where there's a few plants, but you want to make sure you get those seeds. And how do you time it? You know, and so you can put a rubber band on the seed pod, or you can put a little mesh bag around. I mean, you know, there's all these different different approaches. But but yeah, definitely seed limitation can be challenging. Um, and I think for a lot of our habitat in Oklahoma, I think you know unless it's really degraded, um, you know, if you can manage appropriately. So, you know, maybe it hasn't been managed well and there's, you know, red cedar um, encroachment. So if you can remove the cedar and then, you know, follow up with a burn, you know, a lot of times you'll get that native community will come back and it's still in the seed bank and it's still there. And so just being an ecologist, you know, that's, I would rather see that happen so you get what you're supposed to have, you know, versus, you know, trying to go in and plant. You know, so there's certainly areas that, that would need planting that, are not in a condition where the community, native community would come back. But I think we also have the advantage of we have a lot of locations where that native community will come back. So uh, and I have some colleagues in uh, the Natural Resource Ecology and Management Department that you know, that's kind of their, more of their, their focus. Get a red cinder in there. <laughs> it's a whole different topic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we've covered a lot. Have I missed something? Something I should have covered and haven't? I don't even know at this point. <laughs> You're a professor of zoology, or zoology, however you say that. Oh, but I guess technically we're integrated biology now. Oh, because it's been the name change. Okay. We were zoology, <laughs> now we're integrated biology. And the name of your uh, way station is End of the Road, End of Road Pollinator Garden. Is it? That's what I came across on. Oh, you did. Did I say that somewhere? It probably, I do live at the end. I, I have no clue what I submitted because, <laughs> you know, I did it whenever and I turned it in. But yeah. I am at the end of the road, and that would be something I could potentially have put down. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it may be me. A question I was going to, what are your normal, like a typical day with you going out? What tools would you have with you? A net, I'm assuming. But well, what, what it is? depends on the time of year. So I pretty, and I have stuff that's just always in my car, and that being one of them. But, um, but um, you know, if we're going out measuring milkweed density, we have like a 50 meter tape, you know, so we can kind of measure a discrete area, so we know what we're measuring. I've always got these little eight ounce. They're kind of like if you were to get takeout or something, little containers that we poke holes in. So if you find caterpillars, you can put them in there. Uh, our little, the little wax paper glassing envelopes. So if you catch butterflies, you can um, stick them there if you need to bring them back to the lab. And, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of low tech. It's mainly getting places and having manpower to, to do the work and, and look at everything. So, do, you have, do you wear a hat? I do wear a hat. Okay. So, uh, yeah. That with the sun and stuff, you might. You might. It's nice. Yes, yes. And the camera is nice to have. Yeah, although you know you do get lazy and you just use your cell phone, but it's not as good of pictures. But they've gotten better and better though. Yeah. So because it does take more effort to take the take the real camera, right? But, but yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of taking pictures even if they're not good and lots of things. <laughs> And you do a, you're a co-director of OSU Teach? Yes. Does butterflies come into that at any point? It does from time to time. So um, and, and as part of the OSU Teach program, um, so they have a set curriculum that, that students follow. And, um, and actually, I think Dr. Julie Ankle, Ankle and I are both in the Research Matters uh, magazine from, <laughs> from uh, this, this round. Um, but Julie teaches a class this semester where um, so future science teachers um, do research projects with the faculty members so I pretty much always have one of the pre-service teachers in, in my lab and so I have one this semester in, in um, Brooklyn's looking at so you know we have the decanted flies that parasitize the monarchs so it's a little challenging for us in the spring because we don't you know it's not time to really go in the field yet you need to do something for all these months so we're um, going through and doing morphometrics on the fly. So you know, sometimes you'll have, uh, and what is our current record? But sometimes they have like one fly, but they can have up to 15 or 17 from a single caterpillar. So you know, so we, so we have all these flies from all these years. And so we're you know, kind of looking at um, parasitism and resource investment and so fly size relative to number of flies and when they emerge, you know, whether they emerge from the fifth and star or the J or the chrysalis. And, and so, um, yeah, so I, I usually have a pre-service teacher from, from Julie's class working in my room. Teaching oh, and, uh, scientific method. Yeah. Yes, and, then, and, they, um, and they do a poster. Um, and actually my student from um, the year before, um, Shannon, who was also mentioned in the Research Matters article, um, you know, she even won an award for her research project. So the cool thing is, too, they develop a lesson plan, so they translate the research you know, into, into a lesson plan for the classroom. And so I think that's really cool, because I think it also benefits the faculty member in terms of seeing how their research you know, can have that, that K-12 through focus, which um, so it kind of, it's exciting to see all your worlds kind of mesh together and, and collide. So. Constantly so, teaching, aren't you? <laughs> With a touch, touch of research in there. Yeah, yeah. Which do you like better, do, or do you, could you say? It all goes hand in hand. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So. But I could do less sitting in here. That would be nice. <laughs> I'd rather be outside with the students. Or, yeah. She's chasing butterflies. Chasing butterflies. <laughs> I think that's a good way to end. So thank you for sharing your butterfly stories. They're great. Thank you.